It's 2021, and finally, it's the Retro Computer Fair. Yes, after waiting one whole year and an entire plague, it's time. So, I'm going to make myself a nice cup of tea. Here you go, sticking a bit of milk. And I'm going to drink said tea. And then I'm going to get myself in a car, and I'm going to get off to Cambridge. So I decided to drive up the night before. That way I could avoid having to drive there and back on the same day, because, you know, there's a limit to how much driving I want to do. And also it gave me a nice opportunity to enjoy all the myriad traffic jams between where I started and Cambridge. Yeah, it, it, it took a while. Anyway, after what felt like an incredibly long journey, I eventually ended up at the world's most poorly lit hotel, checked in, and then got myself down to the pub so I could meet up with the others. After a rather rude awakening from an alarm clock, I jumped in the car and started to drive my way to the museum. Man, Cambridge's draw distance is terrible. After having got parked up, it was time to head on inside and see what lay in store. One of the things that first hits you when you head in through the front door is that there's a ton of really interesting systems you can look at at this event. Here's an Acorn System 1 a friend of mine has just acquired. This is Acorn's first ever system, and despite the fact that it looks somewhat like a calculator, no, it is actually a real computer. <laughs> There we go, rare things in shoe boxes. There we go. Oh, look, we even got the fucking. Someone's done a very nice job with that. That's just the bare PCB, is it? It's not bad at all, is it? No. That's a very well looked after system one. Give us five minutes and we'll power it up. Oh, okay, we shall be back in a minute. Right. Speaking about very early micros, someone also had a NASCOM 1 kit. Yeah, in the early days of micros, most manufacturers put out a kit that you could build yourself. Well, this is what this is. It's a kit that hasn't been built yet. In fact, once they've opened it all up and we get to the very bottom of the box, you can see they've even provided solder in here to help build it, which is really nice. Move the chairs. It was beating me anyway. I like the way there's under-counter items in this thing. That's where all the best stuff is. Aye. Here we go. Oh, 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 some oh, more tissue up. paper. Yep. Oh. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. Some half sheet. Unbuilt. NASCOM 1. Oh. Very nice. Oh, no, I think we've yeah. got a... Oh. Oh, oh, the, oh, the piece of resistance. Oh, oh, yeah. We've done the keyboard as well. I thought you were missing that. There you go. Still sealed. Ta da! Wow, still it's plastic. There we are, we're doing all the ones today. Yeah. There you go. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And it's got, still got the solder in there yeah. as well. No. Oh, yeah, there's your solder to the. <laughs> Oh, they've already put the solder in the kit. That's amazing. Oh. Are you going to leave it unbuilt or? But for me, this event wasn't about the machines. It was much more about the people. This is a very useful moment to cut over to Dexter from Dexter's Lab and his Quantel paint box. Because here we have interesting machine, interesting person. It's a it's a pretty good combination. Never thought I'd get up close to one of these. Um, and then the, the brush hardware literally adds it to the or um, using maths depending on what you're actually trying to do mm. it'll add it into the store yeah. so read the store add them together and then write it, write it back nice don't worry there's not actually any coffee in that coffee cup if you're interested in the Quantel paint box well then Dexter actually has a YouTube channel where he's been going over this stuff so I'll pop a link in the description below of course there wasn't just super rare TV graphics hardware there oh no there were replicas of other super rare machines. Here we have a particularly nice replica of the Kim 1, the system designed by Chuck Peddle to show off the 6502. In fact, it was so nice. Yeah, I bought one. Of course, it wasn't all about super nice hardware. After all, there was an Aquarius there. Okay, slight jokes about the hardware aside. This demo is more about clever software rather than clever hardware. This is something, well, that most people assumed an Aquarius couldn't do. And Mac, the rather clever coder who put it all together, well, he brought it all the way from Jersey to show it for us. 
Of course, it wasn't all just fellow YouTubers there, kit builders and clever Aquarius programmers. Oh no, I even found an author lurking in the building. Yes, so my name is Stephen Goodwin and I'm the author of a book called 20 Go To 10, which is stories about old computers and the numbers that bring them all together. And one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm at the Computer Museum here in Cambridge to find some of those stories. Because essentially the book is a collection of numbers. It's a dictionary of numbers. You know when you play Scrabble and people say, that's not a real world word. Well, imagine doing that with numbers. People say, that's not a real number. Well, of course it is. Every number is real. And almost every number has a relation to computers in some way. Obviously, there's obvious numbers like 64K and you know 65536 and all those sort of things. So as well as those, I'm looking at other numbers that bring and connect computer things together. So one of the facts that I discovered whilst writing the book was on the Apple II, if you wanted to use the monitor program to write little bits of machine code and edit memory, you'd call a memory location which was minus 151. Not very interesting about that, 151, but the number of Pokemon in generation one was 151. It's a coincidence so far, but what did I say about the monitor program? The monitor program is when you poke memory locations, so you poke memory locations with a monitor program. Pokemon, Pokemon. Both are connected to 151. And yes, it may be a coincidence, or maybe it's not, but it's just one of those many connections that I'm finding out about. You know, Zero, for example, in some cases is an instruction that gives you infinite lives in certain computer games. Sometimes zero is the number of pieces of software written for a particular computer, and I've seen one of them today. 1001. There are actually two computers I've found so far that use 1001 as their designation. Most went for larger numbers like 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 7,001. And it's all these sort of numbers which are far beyond just the basic how much memory did a machine have because it's the stories relating to them. I've seen a circuit board where the um, manufacturing designation was that this board is going to be called 8282 something or other. So the designer made sure they had 82 chips on the board even though it didn't need 82 chips because the board was going to be called an 8280. They put 82 chips on the board. I found the connection between the number 45 and Space Invaders, because the screen for Space Invaders sits here, and it's refracted in a piece of perspex at this angle, 45 degree angle. And there are all these sort of numbers, which give me a really good excuse to talk about old computers in weird and wonderful ways. If I want to talk about piracy, for example, I can talk, connect that to the number 90, because C90 cassettes were used in playgrounds to copy cassettes. I mean, sorry, make a backup of your friend's cassettes. And all of these sort of numbers just come out. And when you start talking to people about old machines and what they remember, you start with one story and you end up with a completely different story. Along the way, there are a lot of numbers. And I've been writing them all down. And I've been writing them down for the last five or six years. And at the moment, I'm doing this crowdfunding campaign to see, are there enough people who would actually want to buy and read this book? Um, which is why I guess I'm doing this piece to camera right now. Uh, so um, if some of those facts seem interesting, there are quite literally a book full of them, which I'm currently writing. So go to the Unbound website, look for 20 go to 10. My name is Stephen Goodwin on the uh, Twitter sphere. I'm the Mark Christa Geek. I follow back and I do tweet about this sort of stuff a lot. So please come along, like, subscribe, sign up for the book, because once it's fully um, financed and that we actually get to make the book because they don't make it unless it's all fully done so go and do it excellent thank you and bye for now now you may have watched that thinking wow that's a really well prepared piece he's just done but nope that thing's totally improvised i've got a script and i don't sound that polished i mentioned this because he pointed out to me that he forgot to tell me that the book is also a choose your own adventure game using go-to statements he really has crammed quite a lot into a single book of course he wasn't the only author there yep the Amiga Addict people were there too. So we have the Amiga 1000, and it's doing the bouncing book, you know, playing balls, it should be. We also have the Amiga Addict people here, look. And here we have the person involved who is not Ravi. <laughs> there we go. And that's the moment the battery ran out of my camera. Well, mobile phone. So I ran off to get a quick recharge and have a cup of tea, and then I was back out filming again. One thing you get from an event like this that you don't get from, say, just looking at videos on the internet and stuff, is that you actually physically get to touch the stuff which means you can discover things that, well, you wouldn't otherwise, like this. Oh, it's actually it's a much more solid switch field than I thought there would be. Is there just like a toggle switch inside? 
that's all it is. It's just yeah. toggled with cheap plastic over the top. Honestly, because I've... See, there's me being surprised that the Switch is actually good and not all just squidgy and naff like I thought it would be. I can also now tell you from practical experience that... Yeah, the Aquarius keyboard is just awful. Oh, and before people mention the comments, yes, I, I know that's not an Aquarius. Although it does look like it has an awful keyboard. I just forgot to film the bit with the Aquarius, so I'll, I'll put this footage here instead. Now, sometimes it's not that the hardware itself is interesting, but that the hardware has a really interesting backstory instead. And this is the case with this one. Software engineer. So he built this up himself and then wrote some data software and used to take it round to all discos in the UK. They had a company <laughs> called Disco Dates. So he basically <laughs> matched people up at discos. It's, it's eight bit Tinder, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh. He's actually included all the newspaper articles. So this is all from the late 70s, yeah. leave it to the love machine, yeah. let's go dances, and then... Early portable computer dancing, yeah. good grief. There you go, disco date, yeah. Uh, what an idea. Yeah. So he, See, must, he must have been one of the first, so let, that's no, all 1979. Nothing's new, that's, that's what we learn here. This thing does an app store. That thing's Tinder. <laughs> now I spent the whole day here, and to be honest, yeah, I could have spent another. Yep, in my whole day, I actually managed to miss some, some pretty significant stuff. Like, if you look at this bit of background footage, you can see just this thing that looks like a BBC micro that's peeping open just, just to the corner of my eye. Yeah, I missed that. That was a breadboard computer that guy designed. That's 6502 nerd right there. Yeah, I only found out about that after the show thanks to a video from Wi-Fi Sheep, who I also missed. I mean, they had a massive sign. Now, one of the really nice parts is you get to just geek out with people. Like, for example, I had a nice chat with this guy who's got this Indigo. The chap spent all morning getting it functioning. We also have a nice Sinclair QL there as well. Once you're chatting to people, people also bring out bits of their collection that they intend to show either later or just brought along to show people who are interested. So you had a couple of STs as well. Now one of the people I got to catch up with but stupidly failed to catch on camera was Johnny Blanchard. These machines are all his. You can find videos about all these machines on Johnny's channel, Reinfused. Again, links in the description below. Now here's a machine I never thought I'd actually get to see, a Ken Bank 1. Well, technically this is one of 40 replicas that got made. Now the person making the replicas is only going to make 40 of them because originally there were only 40 machines. You can tell he's more experienced at doing these shows than anybody else because he remembered to bring one piece of vital equipment that everybody else seemed to forget. Yeah, chair. It, it's a chair. Yeah, you are stood up for a long time at these things. At some point I was going for tea and I wasn't sure I was going because I wanted the tea or I just wanted to sit down. The other thing he had with him, which was surprisingly expensive, was the Aquarius 2. Which is basically the same as the Aquarius 1, only the keyboard is not completely pants. Actually, it's even verging on all right. One part I got to really enjoy was seeing peripherals from machines that I already own. So, here's the Torch Z80 second processor for the BBC Micro and its disc pack. Now, never having owned this Torch Z80 second CPU, there is something I'd always assumed to be true that turns out was not. I thought the second processor was also in the disc pack. It turns out this is just a regular set of BBC disc drives, just branded up as Torch. The CPU is just on a PCB, you pop inside the BBC's case and stick with little sticky feet to the top of the case and just run a cable back out into the tube port. The only thing that's odd about the disc drive is it actually becomes a replacement PSU for the BBC itself. So your normal BBC PSU is removed and you just run a um, DC power supply cable out of the Torx dish pack into the BBC. Now, as I don't own one, yeah, I wouldn't have known that unless he brought it and shown it off to me. Here's the table of Here Be Dragons, the Dragon32 owner who helped organise all of this. He even did some view data pages, look. Well, do you remember that System 1 from earlier? Well, later on in the afternoon, Pete was going to try powering it up for the first time. Always a nervous moment for the retro computer enthusiast is this. Because even though you've checked it over, you never know. Some capacitor might blow or something might just catch fire. Yeah, 
Oh, we got no output. We are drawing, right? I smell something. Yeah, I can smell something burning feet. Yeah. Yeah. Now, me and Johnny Blanchard really did smell something burning then. Yeah, we're not that cruel to wind him up that way. But luckily it was just have it. It wasn't the system one. Yeah, there was a fair bit of dust in that bench PSU you can see him using, and that's what the burning smell was. So me and Johnny could smell it, but Pete, yeah, he couldn't smell it because he had his nose to the system one. That means later on, though, Pete got the thing up and running. Take the crocodile oh, punch off. Look, I'm never going to be able to get these back. Yes, viewers, this is the second time we did this because I put this into time lapse mode by dropping my phone. Yay. He's a professional, though. But I know. Still, it's the system one is going to get twice the use. Yeah, here we go. Right, so here we go. Will it work this time? Yeah. We've got a character. And look, if probably press... more voltage than we did earlier, the more current cycle. And if we press this, we can see it's oh, scanning. Flashing. It's alive. It's scanning, but we'll soon fix it up yeah. and find a way. I loved getting to spend the whole day here. It's lovely to see all these machines, some of which I've never physically been able to touch before. But what really made this thing for me? Yeah, it was the people. If you've never been to an event like this, I'd say go. You get a chance to meet fantastic people, talk, chat. It's a really friendly environment. I mean, if you're feeling a bit nervous or worried about going, just find a machine, stand in front of it, and you'll start geeking out with someone about it pretty darn quickly. Well, it just remains for me to say at this point, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, why not click the thumbs up button below? Or, you know, share it with friends. If there's any of these systems you find particularly interesting or stuff you saw here, why not talk to us about it in the comments section below? If you'd like to help the channel out, why not click the subscribe button and maybe even gently depress the bell icon too? As apparently that makes a really big difference to the YouTube algorithm actually telling people that these videos exist.